Hello, and welcome to this podcast from Podmedics and Elsevier. I'm Ed Wallet, and in this episode, we shall be taking a detailed look at the principles of prescription review. The text for this podcast is taken from the excellent Pass the PSA book available from Elsevier, and a coupon code is available for a discount until the end of 2014. The goals of this podcast are to develop a practical routine for analysing all prescribing situations. We shall also help to identify common traps in the PSA, as well as go through a sample question to show the techniques being used. So, let's start by taking a look at an example question. We shall not go through the answer immediately, but we want you to keep the situation in mind during the episode and attempt to apply the things you learn. So in this case, we have a 74-year-old gentleman who is admitted to hospital with symptoms and signs suggestive of a pneumonia. We also note that his abbreviated mental test score is reduced and he has hemoptysis. Past medical history of note includes hypertension, diverticulosis and a recent transient ischemic attack. He's allergic to penicillin. Reviewing his observations and blood tests, we see a picture compatible with sepsis, with raised inflammatory markers, reduced renal function and hyperkalemia. Next, we are asked to review his current drug chart and mark any drugs that should be stopped. Take a moment, given the situation I've just described, to look at each of the drugs and consider whether it is appropriate. I'll give you a few seconds to do this. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time. So with that case in mind, let's now review a sensible and memorable technique for reviewing prescriptions. This can be summed up with the mnemonic prescribers, where each letter represents an important area of review. Let's start at the beginning with P. P stands for patient details, and is an obvious and sensible place to begin. It is important that the drug chart has at least three pieces of patient identifying information. The most common of these will be patient name, date of birth, and hospital number. So make sure you have the right patient. Next, we have R. This is another very important one. R stands for reactions. You should make sure that the allergy block of the chart is complete and take note of any specific allergies that are present. Importantly for antibiotics, you should remember that common drugs such as coamoxiclav and tazacin both contain penicillin. We skip the E and move to S. S stands for signature or sign the chart. You must make sure that every drug chart is correctly signed. The signature may be omitted in the exam and of course in real life, so please do always check it is there and valid. Now C, the first of our bigger categories. C stands for contraindications, and you should always consider and review four important areas. The first of these are drugs that increase bleeding. Examples here would include aspirin, heparin and warfarin. It is important that in patients who are at risk of bleeding or who are actively bleeding, these agents are withheld. Next is steroids. For patients who are on steroids, always consider the side effects of these medications. These may be remembered with the handy aid memoir of steroid, which is shown here on the slide. If side effects are present, it may be worth considering reducing the dose of the drug. However, be sure to remember that patients who have been on long-term steroids should not have them stop suddenly. Now on to NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It is important to remember the cautions and contraindications here, and once again, there's a handy mnemonic of NSAID to help you remember them. Finally, we come to antihypertensives. If a patient is taking antihypertensives, then you should consider whether these are appropriate to continue. For example, you may wish to stop any antihypertensive agents in the presence of hypotension, bradycardia, or any electrolyte disturbance. An excellent example of this would be a patient with acute renal failure and an associated hyperkalemia who is taking an ACE inhibitor. Next is R, which stands for root. Carefully consider the root for each of the medications on the chart. Particularly pay attention to which drugs should be given by the oral route. Also remember that nil by mouth patients should still receive their oral medications if these are appropriate, of course. Now on to I, which stands for intravenous fluids. Consider whether the patient requires additional replacement fluids, but do not forget to then consider their maintenance fluid requirements, particularly if they're nil by mouth. Always think of fluids in terms of how much and how fast. A detailed discussion of fluid resuscitation and maintenance are beyond the scope of this podcast, but be sure to check out our other episodes that cover this topic in more detail, as well as the book. Next we have B, which stands for blood clot prophylaxis. This is a very important area and easily missed without the prescriber mnemonic. 
Most hospital patients who are not actively bleeding or not just about to have surgery will receive both compression stockings and low molecular weight heparin. However, remember that compression stockings are contraindicated if the patient has peripheral artery disease. We're nearly there. Next is E. E stands for antiemetics, and you should consider these for two groups of patients, nauseated and non-nauseated. In nauseated patients, consider prescribing a regular antiemetic such as cyclozine or metoclopramide. In non-nauseated patients, you should be mindful that they may become nauseated and therefore prescribe similar antiemetics on the PRN or as required section of the drug chart. A common mistake is to prescribe cyclozine in fluid retention caused by heart failure. This should be avoided as it will worsen the retention. Finally, we come to R, which is a very important one, pain relief. Once again, a full and detailed discussion of pain relief medication is beyond the scope of this podcast, but more information can be found both in the book and on other areas of the site. You should always use the trusty WHO analgesic ladder and once again consider if the medication is required regularly or on the as required section of the chart. Also be sure to consider the most appropriate route for the pain relief. Neuropathic pain is treated with a very different range of drugs and it's important to be aware of a few of these. The most common are amitriptyline and pregabalin, both of which are taken at night and have a sedating effect in addition to their analgesic properties. So, we've reached the end of the prescriber mnemonic. Let's now return to our case and use it to review the question. To review, we have a 74-year-old penicillin-allergic man with a history of hypertension, diverticulosis, and TIA, who is presented with hemoptysis, pneumonia, sepsis, and acute renal dysfunction. Reviewing his drug chart, we are asked to mark any drugs that should be stopped or temporarily withheld. I shall give you a moment to run through the prescriber system and come up with an answer. Please pause the video if you need longer. So, let's now review the answer. Let's take each drug in turn. First, aspirin. This patient has presented with hemoptysis, so aspirin should be stopped. In addition, if you look down the chart, you will also see anoxaparin, a low molecular weight heparin. This should also be stopped. Next we come to Ramipril, an ACE inhibitor. The patient has hyperkalemia with a potassium of 5.9. In this setting, an ACE inhibitor is not appropriate and may be contributing to his renal failure. This should be stopped. There are no current contraindications to his regular bisoprolol, so this may be continued. For the drug started on admission, the first big thing that we notice is coamoxiclav that contains penicillin, and we remember that the patient is penicillin allergic. This must therefore be stopped without delay. Paracetamol has been prescribed for pain relief, but it has been written up as one gram every four hours, meaning that the patient is receiving a total dose of six grams per day. The maximum dose per day is four grams for paracetamol, so the frequency here should be six hourly, not four hourly. Anoxaparin, as we've already discussed, has been written up for DVT prophylaxis, but for the same reasons as the aspirin, this should be stopped. Finally, we come to the intravenous fluid chart. Fluids are definitely appropriate in this patient. However, in the presence of hyperkalemia, the addition of 40 millimoles of potassium chloride is not appropriate as it will worsen the situation. So, that's the end of this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and found the topics covered a useful approach to reviewing drug charts. Be sure to practice using the prescriber routine when you're on the wards. More examples of questions as well as chapters on other topics can be found in the book Pass the PSA. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Thanks for listening.